Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Aim to Learn. My name is Matt Minner. I'm a consultant with Catalyst Connection and one of the project managers over our Aim Higher Consortium, and uh, which uh, brings us this Aim to Learn sessions. And today we have Michael Smith of Hammer Industries. So welcome, Michael. Hi, welcome. Thanks for having me, Matt. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. And uh, today, Michael's going to talk with us about a pretty exciting technology that he and the team at Hammer Industries are, are working on and really focused in on. And it's a unique uh, aspect of additive manufacturing, which is cold spray additive manufacturing. And the focus that he's going to touch on and the capability that it provides to the defense community and all types of manufacturing uh, beyond defense is uh, rapid fabrication of large format parts. Uh, so we'll look forward to, to hearing from Michael on that here in a, in a minute. Uh, but as is our, our custom here, we're just going to give a, a quick overview on AIM Hire in case this might be your first time joining us on our AIM to Learn session. So the AIM Hire Consortium is a Department of Defense uh, Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation uh, funded program. And the whole intention is to strengthen and expand the DOD supply chain in Southwest Pennsylvania and West Virginia. We have a focus on the adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies, just like the one we're gonna talk about today. And it really does provide a wide range of, of benefits to supply chain members, both the you know, upper tier direct defense suppliers all the way down to tier two, three, four suppliers that uh, scatter across the, the nation. made up uh, for our AIM Hire Consortium. We've got a lot of key partners. Uh, Catalyst Connection is the lead organization, but a number of our uh, colleagues across the region in terms of other economic development and workforce development organizations. You can see a list there. We also have a number of technology institutes and a number of our universities across the region all working together on the same project to strengthen the defense supply chain and provide resources to our manufacturers. Oh, nice, sorry, I didn't have my, my camera. I'll have that on here for a, a moment as we go. And the last piece, oh, why is that so big? I don't know why that got so big. I couldn't see my screen anymore, so we'll leave it off. Uh, the supplier capabilities database that we uh, we have available this is free for our manufacturers to join and is all in an effort to connect the regional supply chain and uh, promote the capabilities that are available for the defense manufacturing community and just to highlight real quick the regional impact that we've had uh, you see both from a, an investments made uh, of over $22 million of, of program to date, over $130 million in new or retained sales. And one of the, um, I think, most powerful ones that we've been able to impact is uh, over 750 jobs created and retained. Uh, so certainly the, the workforce driver is a big aspect that we, we work towards. And uh, this is, we repeat our Aim to Learn sessions twice a month. Uh, so our next one is coming up on March 9th. And uh, so stay tuned on that one where the speaker will be announced soon. And as always, you're able to access the Aim to Learn recordings uh, on demand on the Aim Hire website. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael and uh, he can talk to us about cold spray additive manufacturing. So I, I made you the presenter, Michael. Uh, so you should be able to go ahead and, and share your screen. Great, great. So one moment. And is that working for everybody? That is coming through. And uh, just as Michael's getting started here, for those on the line, if you have any questions, uh, please post in the chat or the questions panel that you see on the uh, the GoToWebinar drop-down menus. I will be keeping an eye on those and can can chime in and, and uh, pose your questions to, to Michael. So yeah, just go ahead and please share those with us. And with that, uh, go ahead, Michael. Thank you. Great. Uh, so first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mike Schmidt, I'm the CEO of Hammer Industries. Uh, we actually just moved our facilities out here uh, in Pittsburgh. 
uh, located now in, in the southwestern PA region covered by AIM Higher. Uh, we're a startup that formed out of State College, Pennsylvania, um, out of Penn State University. And our focus is on developing advanced materials and manufacturing processes uh, for components that function in extreme environment. And that kind of led us into additive manufacturing where we we learned and saw the value of utilizing additive manufacturing not only as a development tool, but also a sustainment tool to to help our our warfighters and um, uh, and our DoD supply chain. So that's kind of the the emphasis and focus that uh, we'll be having today. So I'm going to turn my camera off for the presentation, and then uh, I'll be discussing cold spray additive manufacturing. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I think I had a notification come up. Are we still good? Matt? Yes, you wish you were all good, Mike. Okay, all right. Okay, <clears throat> so just to provide a, a quick overview of the talk, I'll do an introduction to cold spray. So before we get into the added manufacturing side, just kind of the technology of cold spray, how it was uh, adapted and used initially and how it's then translated to uh, additive manufacturing, and then we'll look at what does that mean? You know, what what kind of benefits does this technology have for us domestically, and then specifically in kind of the regional southwestern PA, West Virginia uh, location covered by AIM Higher, and I, I think there's some some really strong benefits for that, and then future applications um, that cold spray can be developed for. So we'll talk about a lot of uh, applications and, and use cases for it as is, and then you know where can this go in the future. So I'll keep it <clears throat> fairly high level, but there will be you know a little bit of of details and depth kind of sporadic throughout. So in terms of history, uh, cold spray was really started kind of in the 90s, but you can see that you know, it took a while to take off. But in the early 2000s, we really started this kind of exponential growth of interest in cold spray. You see that in the citations of cold spray, uh, publications, research expenditures. And also we're kind of just now starting to see that on the market side of things. So these are market projections on the right from Grandview Research. And it's just kind of showing that's a little bit lagging, but that for a lot of technologies, a lot of newer technologies, you sort of see the same cycle where you have a lot of interest, a lot of R&D. And then once that R&D starts to mature, you start to see the, the market develop itself. So as far as the history of cold spray, <clears throat> I said it mentioned it started kind of in the 90s and it was really developed accidentally. So it was developed in Russia. Uh, they were working in a wind tunnel and they noticed that occasionally some of their metal particles, instead of bouncing off the surface or eroding the surface uh, of, of the test articles, would actually impinge and they would get buildup. Uh, so they saw this and said, hey, maybe, maybe we can actually use this purposefully to try to build a coating or uh, build a part. And that was kind of the, the impetus to start investigating. So initially it was called gas dynamic cold spray um, or supersonic deposition or a variety of different names. But the crux of it is we use a supersonic gas to accelerate particles. So on the right is a diagram of the cold spray process. And you can see uh, a powder feeder that feeds into essentially a rocket nozzle. So a converging diverging nozzle that causes acceleration of the entrained particles. Those particles then impact the substrate, undergo severe plastic deformation and me uh, mechanical and chemical bonding. So when those particles plastically deform, that kind of starts this cold welding process essentially that allows for the chemical and, and bonding to the substrate and to the underlying particles. The, the major difference for cold spray versus many other processes is that there's no substantial melting. So we're not melting the feedstock material, which means you're able to keep and maintain compositional control, um, uh, thermal profile control, tempers and things like that. And that's just uh, not common for, for many of the repair applications. And repair is really where cold spray was originally focused. Um, they saw the value for being able to spray a metal coating onto a surface and do dimensional repair. And then eventually that, that has moved towards and the development focused on can we get structural 
you know, actual mechanical integrity repair. So for cold spray, <clears throat> there's a few key parameters. So you would assume that if, uh, if we're looking for supersonic velocity to, to entrain those particles, then gas pressure is gonna be kind of our, our main variable. And it is important, but I've shown just uh, kind of one of the guiding equations uh, for 1D fluid flow for through the nozzles. And really what impacts us and, and what kind of our, our best knobs to turn are, are the temperature of the gas and the gas type. Um, so the more viscous the gas, the, the lighter the gas, um, and, and kind of the, the specific heat of the gas combined with the temperature determine how well that gas is going to accelerate and transfer that velocity to the particle. And the temperature uh, kind of dictates how much it needs to cool, so how much energy can be transformed from thermal energy into kinetic energy. And then that all goes into the powder, which accelerates to the substrate. So these are some of the knobs we can turn in terms of the processing for the machine. And then in terms of what you get, it's obviously very heavily dictated by the particle size, the shape, and the composition. So you can imagine a harder particle is, is more challenging to deform, which requires more energy input in order to deposit and adhere to the substrate. Likewise, a particle that's perfectly spherical is going to behave better uh, while traveling through the nozzle than something that is, um, has less sphericity. And particle size and density, um, that goes to acceleration and, and drag forces and so forth. So those are our parameters, both for spray, for the particle side, but also in terms of how they're going to deposit and what's going to happen once it gets to the surface. So not only do we need good velocity, but we also have to have the right properties at the surface in order for the coating to, to build up. So <clears throat> that, that's sort of the history of cold spray, but then there's, there's kind of the fundamental mechanism of, you know, okay, what if, if, if we have powder impacting the surface, what's fundamentally making that deposit. Um, and this is where things kind of get a little bit hairy in the community and where it's important for, for when we move into to the additive side of things. So what most people can agree on is that metallic bonding is occurring. So this isn't just a, a mechanical uh, interlocking mechanism or something. This is metallic bonding. We're getting uh, high strength out of these. We can get near rot properties. Uh, we can get improvements over casting. And I have a few images here just to kind of demonstrate. You can get you know, very dense, dense coatings. We see that at the top left, there's a coating in substrate. We see a particle impact in the middle where it's clearly depositing and bonding to the surface. And then the right is, is a TEM that shows that there's you know, a very clean interface. There's nothing at the interface. These are essentially two grains uh, as far as we're concerned. So generally, everyone can agree that metallic bonding does occur. But then the when and why of that is what is still very much up for debate in the community. So there's generally kind of two schools of thought in that the conditions necessary for bonding either depend on adiabatic shear and stability mechanisms or hydrodynamic shock mechanisms. Um, kind of both camps, both schools of thought have presented compelling arguments. Um, I think this is going to be an ongoing issue for the community. And the reason that's important is <clears throat> the, the more you can understand the fundamental behavior and what's required to get that metallic bonding, we know it occurs, but what are the conditions that force it to occur allows you to kind of broaden your, your processing envelope and to do that in a more meaningful and tailored and thoughtful way. So if, if we don't really know why and when something bond, we just know you have to have a high enough energy that a lot of people will just play the game of essentially spraying it and see what sticks. Uh, and that might work uh, for some applications uh, and some cost scenarios, but if you have a powder that's very expensive or, or something where you really need a solution and you, you can't do a bunch of experimentation, having that fundamental understanding is, is necessary. So that's something that the community is working towards and, and has made, great improvements in and has allowed sort of the development of the additive side of this and, and transition out of just doing this as a surface technique and doing this as an additive technique. So at a high level, you know, why are we interested in cold spray? Why, 
why change this into an additive technique and develop this further? So one thing is <clears throat> inherently cold spray is uh, generally a robotic -y process. It can be done manually, but it's a robotic process and it's fairly high efficiency. So generally we get very good uh, material utilization ratios or deposition efficiencies. Another benefit is it's low thermal input. Uh, so they have an image there, uh, it's a little bit crop, but you can see that the surface temperature maybe maybe hits about 250 C. We might have gas temperatures anywhere from 500 to 800 C, but the particles rarely approach those gas temperatures. They're, they're generally actually you know, close to ambient. And the only, the, the temperature is just coming from the gas stream uh, impinging on the surface. So we have low temperatures at the surface, that's why we call it cold spray. And that low thermal input gives us a lot of, a lot of benefits. We're not melting the feedstock material, um, which for, for various alloys can be beneficial. Uh, that means we're gonna have less oxygen pickup, uh, less requirements for shrouding gas. And uh, importantly, it's also our residual stresses are impact. So if you think of a weld uh, and everything we need to do to have a nice clean weld, we can avoid a lot of that with cold spray. Uh, in terms of residual stresses, cold spray can actually provide a compressive residual stress state. Um, so that's beneficial, obviously, from a mechanical standpoint for the surface, uh, but it's also beneficial in terms of a corrosion or, or cladding uh, type application where we're trying to minimize something like, say, stress corrosion cracking. So cold spray has seen a lot of use uh, and a lot of interest for cladding applications where we want to protect from uh, a corrosion environment and we can spray a corrosion resistant material in a compressive state on a surface uh, of an otherwise uh, susceptible material. So you can, you can start to use uh, more inexpensive, easier to use materials and then coat it with something like an Inconel or, or another corrosion resistant alloy and save yourself uh, money and, and time. And then finally, cold spray is amenable to a variety of different metals, ceramics, polymers, and kind of composites thereof. So if we think about uh, welding, uh, you're not really going to get a weld of a cermet uh, or, or weld onto a polymer, whereas cold spray gives you the, the ability to do that. So as far as a, a surface repair technique and a surface technique, there's really a lot of benefits to cold spray. <clears throat> there's, of course, drawbacks, um, and there's kind of drawbacks in tandem with a lot of those benefits. So yes, it's robotic and high efficiency, but it's also line of sight and very angular dependent. So if we can't get a nice normal impingement onto the surface, we may not be able to deposit uh, at, at nearly the same efficiency and it's line of sight. So if we can't get a line of sight on it, if you can't manipulate your nozzle into a region, you can't really coat that part. Uh, low thermal input is great. <clears throat> Being cold has its advantages, but that means we can't do pure ceramics. So we can't melt the materials. Ceramics don't have ductility. So we really can't deposit pure ceramic coatings. Uh, as far as residual stresses go, yes, we can tailor them to be compressive, uh, but they can be quite severe. So if, if you're not paying attention to the, the stresses that you're putting down and, and the parameters that you're using, they may be beneficial for some applications, but they may just be too high, even if they are compressive and you may have spallation uh, or delamination of that surface repair. And they're amenable to a lot of different materials, but it's under the right conditions. Um, and those conditions can be a, a very tight processing window for certain materials, uh, which can lead to uh, a lot of challenge. So as far as materials and applications, that's the kind of final thing I wanna finish up with before we start moving towards the additive side of things, it's been, developed for a host of different materials. Um, a variety of aluminum family, nickel, copper, iron, titanium family alloys, um, some low melting temperature alloys like tin, babbits, etc. Refractories, um, niobium, tantalum, molybdenum, and some alloys therein, and then uh, a variety of cermets. Um, tungsten carbide cobalt is one of the most common along with nickel chrome carbide, but there's been oxide cermets and, and a variety of different materials. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but this just kind of gives an idea. And as, as well as polymers, uh, spraying onto polymers is, is another advantage of cold spray. So 
the applications it's been used for kind of range everywhere. So it's been used for DOD applications. It's been used for industrial applications and research applications. I mentioned corrosion repair before, uh, dimensional restoration. Um, so that's there's an example shown at the top of a dimensional restoration. So these are, you know, non-loading parts where we're not looking at actual structural performance. <clears throat> and those were sort of the initial application of cold spray was these dimensional restoration and has since now moved to the point where uh, it's, it's approved for structural applications and structural repairs, which is uh, a, a boon to this technique. Um, near net fabrication, we'll get into that with the additive side of things, heat sinks, claddings, and a variety of DOD examples. It's been used in Air Force, um, it's Army, Navy, et cetera, and uh, many of them have systems in-house that they utilize cold spray for, for qualified repairs. So <clears throat> you can see there's there's pretty clear advantages in, in use of the cold spray methodology. When we look at it from a manufacturing point of view, um, sure, we, we've shown that it could be used for sustainment, for surface repair, for component repair, and that's obviously very useful to, to the goal of aim higher. But manufacturing is kind of the, the flip side of that coin. Can we make parts with it uh, from the ground up? So the answer is yes, <clears throat> it's inherently amenable to, to additive. So the cold space process is, uses a robot. So that's, that's kind of one of our first keys. It's a layer by layer process from the get go. And we have tool part planning to achieve that layer by layer deposition. So it, the question is kind of, well, why wasn't that done immediately? If we're already doing tool path planning, we're already depositing something layer by layer, you know, what took so long to move towards an additive approach for this? And there's a lot of challenges and, and that's part of it. So there are numerous challenges to address. Um, number one is we're spraying out a nozzle. So there's a, sort of a Gaussian profile of those particles as they exit the nozzle. And that's going to give you a Gaussian deposition profile. So this is a, a, a paper that kind of describes some of uh, the, the thoughts and considerations that go into additive for cold spray. It's just how you pl plan out your pathing and how you actually build a part. So it's not, not a, a simple profile to, to build up your part. You have this Gaussian path that you're then going to deposit. And then when you start to consider, if you start building vertically, how do you achieve vertical walls when you have a, a spray pattern like that? So then we have to get more complex with our planning. We can't just spray everything at a 90. We have to start uh, manipulating our tools and changing our angles in order to be able to achieve a vertical wall. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. And then understanding that as we change our angle, we're going to change our deposition efficiency. So how do we change our robot traverse and our feed rate and all of our other parameters to ensure that we build up at the same rate as we change our angles and change our, our standoff distances and all these other parameters to achieve dimensional uh, accuracy to our drawing or to our CAD file. So this is kind of the, the feedback loop and the iteration that, uh, took several years for, for a few companies to figure out and, and a variety of researchers. Uh, and it all really comes back to toolpath planning and having intelligent toolpath planning. The other part is it's not just toolpath planning, but it's efficient toolpath planning. So with cold spray, <clears throat> it's a little different than the other additive techniques, particularly when we're talking uh, the metal side for for example, the powder bed fusion, we have a laser. That laser can turn on and off and can, uh, uh, can be applied anywhere in the build at any time. For cold spray, as we spray, we're continuously spraying a stream of particles so that we can't really pause the print and move to a new area. We can't rapidly transfer from, from one location to somewhere else just by to modifying our lens. There's going to be a bead or a path of that spray from one location to the next. So if you're not intelligent and efficient in how you do that toolpath planning, everywhere you do a turn, you can have a little buildup and then eventually you end up being overbuilt or underbuilt depending on your setup. So the toolpath planning was really critical and, and it was kind of the, the hurdle that needed to be achieved to allow for cold spray to be an additive technique. The other aspect was addressing clogging. Um, so for doing 
you know, an additive part, we're no longer just spraying for a few minutes. Uh, we, we can spray for hours for large parts. So if you're spraying for hours, uh, you have to make sure that you're not getting clogging in that nozzle. So the nozzle itself might be a few millimeters, but the nozzle throat uh, is, is much smaller. Um, so you, in that case, you're, you're kind of inviting clogging to occur the longer you spray. So how do you ensure that you have the right materials in your nozzle to prevent clogging, that you have the right thermal profiles, boundary layer behavior? So that's kind of the other part of this coin was, how do you ensure that you don't get clogging? Because once you clog, uh, your run is effectively stopped. You have to fix that nozzle or get a new nozzle. Um, I will, I guess, point out that unlike some of the other additive techniques, cold spray does have the benefit that you could just simply resume spraying. Um, so it's more of a, a time issue and a cost issue, but it's still a, a critical issue to address. Um, and then predicting part geometry and performance. Uh, so that's kind of shown at the bottom right there looking at what's, what does a simulated spray look like, and then what does the actual part look like. And you can see that uh, this is from one of the manufacturers, Speed 3D. This process is, has been pretty ironed out uh, for certain materials and, and certain applications. So, <clears throat> you know, why do we want to use cold spray as an additive technique? Well, really a lot of the same reasons. We have a robotic method, it's high efficiency, it's not using a lot of material. Uh, and I'll talk about that later, especially when we compare that to some of the other metal additive techniques, uh, material usage and, and cost are, are large drivers. Low thermal input, again, we're not melting the materials, we're not getting crazy residual stress states, um, which is, is something we really have to be concerned with um, for something like a directed energy or a laser powder bed or even method. And it's amenable to metals, ceramics, polymers, composites. Uh, so again, kind of a wider swath of materials can be utilized uh, in, in cold spray versus some of the other additive techniques. So it's an attractive way to fabricate a three-dimensional part if we can do it. Some other benefits um, that, are, that are kind of unique to, to the additive side are high build rates. Um, so for cold spray additive, they've been able to achieve build rates on the order of uh, you know, liters per hour or, or more. Um, so we can get substantially higher build rates, uh, almost an order of magnitude higher than what you know, a typical laser powder bed is going to achieve in cold spray. So it's a rapid process uh, shown at the top left. Uh, uh, took a little over an hour for a 1.5 kilogram part, uh, which, which really isn't too bad. And that's, that's not really on the fast side for cold spray. High deposition efficiency. Uh, so I have an image here um, of a laser powder bed system. Every time the roller rolls over and applies a new, a new layer of powder, we're essentially wasting material. Um, there's obviously a lot of consideration going into powder reuse and powder recycling, but there's an enormous amount of waste um, in a lot of these systems. Uh, cold spray, we can get deposition efficiencies or material usages in the realm of 99%. Um, so we have very, very little material waste in certain scenarios with, with certain alloy systems. Laser coupling is not a thing, obviously, in cold spray, so we're using that supersonic velocity. So without the laser coupling challenges, we can deposit materials like aluminum and copper and, and some things that are a little more challenging from, from either a thermal standpoint or, or getting the energy into that material. And then finally, it's, it's scalable. Um, so on the top right, I've shown a gantry system with a cold spray uh, head applied to it, uh, manufactured by Titanic. They can scale this, you know, parts from cold spray to many meters. Um, so if we compare that to uh, uh, the powder bed systems, there's really just no comparison in the size. Um, and, and directed energy is, is maybe a more apt comparison of what we can do in terms of scalability. So it's a, it's a very intriguing technique. The drawbacks, again, <clears throat> there's, there's drawbacks kind of to each advantage. So high build rate means lower resolution. So generally the faster you build, the lower your resolution is, and, and that's no different here for cold spray. In terms of efficiency, uh, if we get nozzle clogging, uh, that's, a, that's a change out, and that's, that's a lot of wasted time and wasted material. Um, and it's not an instantaneous full clog. 
it happens slowly. And as it happens, your efficiency goes lower and lower and lower and lower until you finally can't spray anymore. So there can be some wasted material there. Um, no laser coupling means we have kind of an expanded repertoire of materials that we can potentially use in some circumstances. But in other circumstances, there's materials that might be easy for a laser-based system or an e-beam-based system that are very challenging for cold spray. So things like high strength, um, very hard materials are effectively not feasible or, or very, very expensive to do with cold spray and require things like helium um, and, and very high operating parameters that just make it uh, either untenable or, or incredibly expensive. And then scalability, <clears throat> it exists. Uh, we see the advantages for it, but it really hasn't been commercially demonstrated. Um, so making several meter sized parts, uh, there's the equipment to do it, but I would say it's it's more conceptual than not at this stage. So why use uh, CCM? You know, when do you want to consider CCM? Why do you like it over some of those other additive techniques? So like I mentioned before, no melting, but like I mentioned, uh, no melting. So why is that important? So there's, there's a few reasons. Um, number one, you're not getting changes in the melt chemistry and changes of the performance due to that melt chemistry. You're not picking up oxygen, having oxidation. The other thing is we can maintain a temper. Um, so when we consider DOD applications where we have to qualify any new, new materials or new manufacturing methods, if we can maintain a temper and we're using a material that's already qualified, that gets us closer to something like a drop-in replacement. Um, so that's that's a kind of a really unique advantage of cold spray, is that we're not melting it, so we can potentially do that. <clears throat> and again, uh, kind of keeping in line with the AIM High or Southwestern PA, there's a company out here, Metal Powder Works uh, in Pittsburgh, that is developing a process to make uh, alloy powders from a mechanical process, so that way they can maintain a temper and you can potentially print parts directly and, and kind of overcome, overcome one of those hurdles. So that's a unique facet for cold spray. Tailorable stress state is another one. We can get tensile, we can get compressive, we can get stress neutral. Um, so having the ability to tailor that is very important. Being able to build onto a substrate. Um, so compared to some of the other additives, we can deposit directly onto a substrate. So really directed energy is kind of the only thing that's, that's comparable to additive. Uh, or cold spray additive in, in that respect. Um, also generally scalable to larger parts, like I mentioned. Um, and when you talk about building onto a substrate, not only am I talking about repairing parts, but also you can think like cl cladding parts or doing multi-material or multi-layer parts where you have one material on the inside and another material on the outside. That's entirely feasible with cold spray. Uh, and you don't have to worry about reactions between those two materials. So especially for things like copper, uh, and other alloy systems that might react and, and form very brittle intermetallic phases, we can avoid that in cold spray because there's no melting. So all the benefits kind of tie together. And again, as I mentioned, the build rates can be dramatically higher in cold spray. So in terms of kind of the manufacturing ecosystem, when do you want to use or consider cold spray additive? For traditional, um, you consider it because it's a faster alternative to forging and casting. So just like any other additive, you know, we can process a part in hours versus forging and casting could take, you know, months or, or a year to get a part out. Um, so you can get better val value at lower volumes. So if we're only printing a few parts, um, the, the, the cost of getting a new die set and setting up a new forging or casting process is very capital intensive. So you really have to make a lot of parts for that to make sense. Uh, Additive is, is kind of on the other side of things. Uh, and it can be used to optimize part geometry before creating a forging or casting die. So if a company wants to iterate their design a few times, then settle in, then make a large volume of parts, it's advantageous to use something that's additive at first. Um, so these are really additive advantages, but they scale especially with cold spray uh, if we're thinking about larger parts or, or parts that have the value statement for cold spray. Complex geometries, of course, or anywhere where there's grading or composites are desired. So traditional manufacturing just can't, can't hit that. For versus metal manufacturing, um, 
when do we want to consider cold spray? So if our surface finish is less important, uh, if the resolution loss that we have with cold spray isn't really a big deal, um, so machining is allowable for your process, then you can take advantage of the high build rate and the low cost of cold spray. If large sizes are required, uh, it may be one of your only options is to look at cold spray additive or WAM uh, or, or a large scalable process like that. If multi-material and multi-layer are desired, um, cold spray additive is, is probably the only uh, or arguably the only technique that even has the potential to get us there with metals. And if speed and cost are major drivers. Uh, again, it's a very low energy input method. We're not using lasers. We're not using a lot of energy. We're using compressed air, compressed gases. So there's low energy, there's low cost. Uh, it's a rapid process. So there's low cost in terms of overhead and time and labor. So we can print parts very, uh, very cost effectively with cold spray. So we kind of now understand all those benefits. So what does that mean for, for AIM Hire, uh, for the domestic supply chain? So it's an excellent tool for, for industry and DOD sustainment activities. Uh, we can say that with certainty. So cold spray is, is already qualified for a variety of DOD components. So kind of extending that to cold spray additive uh, is not a huge hurdle in my mind. Um, and just as at a high level, using cold spray and using additive in general can help us kind of prevent some of those single points of failure where there's one company you know, one location in the US that can make this part for DOD or supply this part, or, or maybe it's not even in the US. So having other places where you can have drop-in solutions, print those solutions and get them out quickly, uh, and it's not a forging or a casting that takes a year is a big advantage. And then it also that can reduce lead times uh, and enable an iterative design. So if you're reliant on a casting or forging process to make a part, Many times you really have to get that design right from the beginning. So when you know as an engineer that you have to get the design right, you're, you're going to tend to design cautiously. Uh, so in this case, if, if you get the chance to iterate on your design and try a few things before you settle down and you can do that cost effectively, that allows you to push the envelope in your designs and in and, and uh, the ways that you want to build that part or, or manufacture that part, which allows you to uh, potentially get better performance. Um, so by reducing the lead times and the cost, we can also potentially allow just overall better development cycles by incorporating additive. Um, and, and we've seen that the Defense Department is, is uh, you know, obviously very interested. AIM Hire is, is itself kind of devoted to this issue. And I think additive is well suited to address many of these challenges and, and in particular, I think cold spray additive is great for some of the large format and some of some of the more uh, challenging and unique problems that face our supply chain. <clears throat> so regional benefits is another thing I want to touch on. Southwestern PA is just, and, and, and even the West Virginia region, uh, just from, the, from a regional standpoint, are both incredibly well suited for AM adoption. Um, so, we're in Pittsburgh, we just moved here, and we're already seeing the benefits of being in this area. You have numerous academic institutions uh, that are focused on additive. So just in the city, you have Pitt and CMU are incredibly focused on additive, on robotics. You have Robert Morris that has uh, a focus there as well in, in workforce development. And then within you know, a, a short drive, you have Case Western, NASA, Akron, you have Penn State to the east, and West Virginia to the south. So you have a numerous you know, academic institutions and, and federal laboratories that kind of support innovation and support uh, additive manufacturing specifically and workforce development. Also regionally, we're obviously in a great place for legacy manufacturing. So there's still a lot of manufacturing around in this area. And it's still an area that has the workforce, that has the knowledge and has, importantly, the facilities for manufacturing. So we, we have all of the finishing services that we need. We don't need to ship them across the country to get samples heat treated. We don't need to ship them across the country to get them uh, analytically characterized or tested. That is all local to this region and it's unique to have that to this region. 
And then also we have the feedstock in this region. So you have uh, companies like ATI, companies like Metal Powder Works uh, that are in this region and, and several, several others um, all kind of located in the AIM hires region. So we have essentially what is, what is something close to um, kind of like a, a vertical installation, uh, vertical integration. Um, we also have shipping and transportation. So we can not only make the parts, we can make, get the feedstock, make the parts, finish the parts all locally, save an enormous amount of time and cost with not having to ship things across the country. But then we can get them out locally as well and get them to wherever we need, either by shipping, by ground transport, or by air transport. Uh, there's also you know, organizations supporting this already, which is helpful. So we have Mill 19, Pitt, CMU, and, and a variety of other organizations. ARM calls this home, um, Catalyst is there. So we have people focused on additive, focused on robotics, and focused on manufacturing, setting up homes, setting up collaborations, and, and having people work together, which is exactly what we need to kind of solve these manufacturing problems. We're located at Neighborhood 91, so this is a bit of a plug for that, but <clears throat> the goal of this, this campus is to vertically integrate all of these things, to have the powder on site, the manufacturers on site, to have the gases that we need on site, and to have the finishing services. That way, as a manufacturer, you can come and you'll have everything you need. You can just walk down the street. There's no shipping involved. So you, you pick up the powder next door, you walk down the street, you, you hand your part off, you get a machine, you pick it up, and you go over to the airport and ship it out, and you can do that in two days. Uh, and that's just unheard of. So you imagine what you could do with that kind of rapid production capability, making large additive parts, and how you could help uh, the DOD supply chain and, and, and industry at large. And you see there's really an advantage that this region is just particularly well suited for. Um, so as, as far as applications, I've, I've highlighted you know, when and where cold spray is useful, when and where additive is of interest. So I'll kind of wrap it up with just where I see some future applications going for cold spray additive. Um, and cold spray in general and, and where I think there's interest. And this is, of course, in addition to what people are already working in for DOD sustainment, for industry sustainment, and other research activities. And <clears throat> I'll be honest, many of these are, are things that we're particularly interested in and are working in and that, that we hear our collaborators are in. So hypersonics is a large area of interest for cold spray. Um, and there's a lot of advantages for using cold spray additive in this regime and the materials that are of interest here um, at ceramets, um, ceramic to, to metal joining and high temperature metals. Gas turbine engines have a, a number of uh, applications in which we could utilize cold spray. Uh, fission components, there's been uh, various people that have been exploring using cold spray for nuclear applications, um, ourselves among them. It's been demonstrated as a uh, a beautiful technique for repair and sustainment of uh, nuclear fuel storage canisters. Uh, it's been demonstrated by VRC for uh, some valve um, repairs and, and uh, flange repairs for, for some nuclear applications, I believe. So there's interest in nuclear, there's interest in fusion, uh, things like diverters and, and some other areas uh, where being able to, to fabricate multi-layer and multi-material um, <clears throat> Components can really have value. Um, test rigs, uh, things, facilities at NASA, just applications where we need kind of a combination of material properties in a complex geometry. And cold spray is just uniquely suited to do that type of application. Munitions is some area that we're focusing on. And then UAVs, UUVs, and, and ground vehicles are also of interest. And then I'll kind of wrap up with um, the other the the other aspect of future work is just getting the better understanding of the fundamentals so tying this back to the beginning understanding the how and why the mechanistic uh fundamental description of bonding is occurring in cold spray will allow us to really expand our capabilities expand print resolutions design prints better uh, select new materials and that's that's ongoing work by a variety of institutions. Uh, so I'll just play a little 
video of a combined Eulerian Lagrangian simulation. So this is just looking at the splat of a particle and, and these are ongoing simulations that we're doing and that many are doing to look at fundamentally what's happening to temperatures, residual stress states uh, and, and particle behavior that causes bonding. So uh, I think that's that's everything I wanted to cover today and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you all for, for your time and for tuning in. Well, thanks, Mike. That was uh, very informative. You definitely covered a, a lot of ground on cold spray additives. So that, you know, thank you very much. I think just to, you know, one question, just to better understand kind of the uh, the current space when it comes to cold spray additive. You know, you mentioned that it, you know, has been used for repair applications for for some time, but when it comes to the use of it in structures, is that something that's still um, you know, primarily in the research phase, and is like Hammer Industries one of the the first that's bringing that into the uh, kind of more commercial space? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it's definitely been been demonstrated and and qualified for structures. That's that's more recent. So I'd say that's within the past few years that it's been there. <laughs> but it's one of those things where once it's really hard to get that first one. But once you get that first one, it makes the subsequence easier. Um, so, so people have gotten that first one. Uh, that's been achieved in, in the DoD ecosystem. And now you can start having um, you know, uh, qualified materials and qualified spray procedures and QSPs. And those can start translating to new materials and new components. Uh, and, and get that ball rolling. So kind of achieving that first one has allowed us, and given uh, Navy, for example, the confidence to start looking at, okay, this is real, it works, we demonstrated it, we've tested it, now where can we apply this? So now the question is, is you know, where are the components where we can leverage this? And that's where you kind of have to have the conversation with DOD and, and industry and just figure out what makes sense? What applications can you leverage the, the capabilities here? Okay, well, very good, Mike. I think uh, don't we have, don't have any other questions. Uh, so again, you know, everyone, if you want to uh, revisit this at, at any point in time, we'll have the recording up on the Aim to Learn site soon. And I uh, just want to thank you once more, Mike, for, for joining us today. This was great. Yep, thanks, Matt, I appreciate it. All right. Well, everyone have a, a great afternoon and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.